we'll have to click OK to. Um, now I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Fabiana Pereira is an assistant professor at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. She completed her PhD at the Department of, Psych of Political Science at the George Washington University. Fabiana, you can take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is an honor to be here with you guys at the University of Maryland. Even though I've lived in DC for many years, I've never actually been to you guys' campus. Um, before or to start, I think you guys are now separate, but I haven't been there in person, but it's nice to be there virtually with you. Today, I thought we would talk about U.S.-Venezuela defense relations. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about, which means that I occasionally get carried excited, get carried away, and instead of sounding very professional and measured like Aaron, start to speak really fast. Um, please do find a way somehow to interrupt me if I'm talking too fast. Um, so we'll be talking about U.S.-Venezuela defense relations. This is um, one of my main areas of expertise. Like Erin said, I'm an assistant professor at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. That is the Defense Security and Cooperation Agency Regional Center for North, Central, and South America and the Caribbean. So I work closely with partner nations, not yet with Venezuela, but hopefully maybe in the future. Part of the talk that I'm going to give you today are from a forthcoming chapter for a book. I co-wrote the chapter with Dr. John Polga Hesmovich, who is an assistant professor of political science at the US Naval Academy in Annapolis. Um, when I'm using material that's directly from that, I'm referring to it in the slide. We hope that chapter will be out next year. Um, okay. Oh, and I am going to try uh, to leave ample time for questions at the end, as I found that the second you say anything about Venezuela, people raise their hands with questions. It's a complicated case. It's an interesting one, and I'm very interested in any questions any of you might have. So here we have a quote uh, from U.S. President, uh, from President Clinton from 1987. For the last 80 years, Venezuela has been a rock of reliability from the world wars to the Gulf Wars, and for that, every American is grateful. This sounds surprising in the current context of U.S.-Venezuela relations, but it was fairly typical of the time that Venezuela was actually a very strong partner across many areas, including defense for the United States, uh, this was part of Clinton's, President Clinton's toast when he visited Venezuela in 1997 while he was president. He was the last U.S. president to visit the country. There has since been no uh, diplomatic visit at the highest level, which is a clear sign of how much the relationship has deteriorated, both of how close the relationship was, as symbolized in President Clinton's visit, and how much it has deteriorated. The second quote on this slide um, is a much more recent one. And this one is from Admiral Fowler's testimony uh, on the Hill. Admiral Fowler, of course, is the commander of US Southern Command. And here he says, at the heart of the threat in Venezuela is the undermining of democracy. And I thought it was interesting because we see a big shift from rock of reliability, which is probably the highest praise, to being called in a threat, which is uh, directly by a high-ranking military officer. So there's been obviously a very big shift in defense rela in relations overall, and specifically in defense relations between Venezuela and the United States, and that's what we're going to be discussing. That big shift is kind of summarized in these two very short vignettes, and we're going to talk about the trajectory of that. Um, so today I hope to make two main points throughout this talk. The first is that the election of Hugo Chavez Frias marked a breaking point in the U.S.-Venezuela defense relations. And second, that the U.S.-Venezuela defense relation really has three main drivers. And that's regime type, the situation in Colombia, and economic conditions. I maybe could have organized these as regime, um, economy, and then Colombia, but I think it'll make sense this way. So those are the main points that 
I hope to be able to drive home during our time together today. So to start off, in the first part, we're going to talk about what the relationship was like prior to 1999. 1989 was, of course, um, the year that Chavez came into power in Venezuela. So this graph might be familiar to some of you. This is taken from the Polity Project. Um, and it shows regime type. The flat blue line that's above the six that covers probably the majority of the period depicted in the chart is the time period for which Venezuela was democratic. The line in red and specifically the line in red under that dotted six line is the period during which Venezuela was autocratic. You can see that even at the start of Chavez, the year he gets elected, we don't yet see a big shift. The shift um, comes later. So what's important to talk about here is that during the period that Venezuela was democratic, that flat blue line above the six that goes um, from 1958 to about the year 2000, not only was Venezuela democratic, but Venezuela was democratic in a region where most other countries were autocratic. So Venezuela really was a rock of reliability, as President Clinton said. During this time, U.S.-Venezuela relations across many fronts, including defense relations, were very close. They did not change precipitously as there was a change in regime type because the change in regime type, maybe contrary to how it's perceived in this graph, was not precipitous. The change in regime type was slow. It was more of a slow erosion of democracy rather than an overnight shift from democracy to autocracy. As you might remember, Chavez did not come into power through a coup, though he did lead a coup um, attempt that failed about 10 years before he came into power. He came into power through elections, which he won. He won the popular vote by a large margin, um, but then stayed on power, stayed in power for longer than the constitution allowed at the time he was elected through a series of changes to Venezuelan institutions that represented an, ero an erosion of democratic norms and really moved the country further to autocracy. It's very hard to say what was the year that Venezuela became autocratic. It depends on what indicator you're looking at and it depends on what facet of democracy you're interested in. Like I said, Chavez was elected in 1989, re-elected in 2000, re-elected in 2006, and then re-elected again in 2012. So given the enormous amount of elections, uh, you would be tempted to think, oh, the country was democratic at the time. However, in the same time period, we had a boycott of legislative elections by the opposition in 2005, um, a contested election in 2012, and the death of Hugo Chavez Frias in 2013. In addition to that, there was an expansion of the Supreme Court, a complete dismantling and reorganization of the legislature um, and a number of, and dismantling of one of the biggest TV networks in the country, which think, represented a significant blow to freedom of speech. So while we can say confidently that the relationship between the US and Venezuela was very strong during the period in which Venezuela was democratic, and of course the US was democratic as well, we cannot say that there was an overnight shift when the country um, transitioned to autocracy because in the case of Venezuela, the transition to autocracy was slow and hard to pin down to a specific event. Or rather, the event to which you pin it depends on what aspect of democracy you're most interested in. The second factor that affects US-Venezuela defense relations is Colombia. Colombia is the third person in that marriage. And it, it plays a role in that during the time that there was instability in Colombia, during the height of drug cartels, Venezuela, as a democratic country, was again, as President Clinton said, a um, rock of stability in the region so that the US could partner with Venezuela to address the drug situation in Colombia, which at the time was the primary uh, concern for US national security in the Western hemisphere. So we can see that as, or we can see, but I am narrating that 
ask that relationship, ask Colombia is able to address its own domestic problems in Venezuela in, goes into democratic recession, the U.S. starts to move away from Venezuela and in a closer relationship with Colombia. One thing that we learned from looking at this relationship over time is that it is not has not so far been possible for the U.S. to be both a strong partner to Colombia and a strong partner to Venezuela. This is implications when we think about a possible transition away from Chavismo and into democracy um, in the future, but we'll talk about that. Um, later. So here we see again, this um, is taken from the forthcoming chapter that I mentioned with John Koga, and it shows in US dollars, in current US dollars, the amount of US assistance to Venezuela. We see the, a drop as regime type changes. Again, 1999, that third column is the year Chavez comes into power. Um, around the year 2006, most of the indicators of lack of democracy in the country had already come into play and we see how that assistance to Venezuela really, really diminishes. Um, on the flip side, assistance to Colombia remains strong. I don't think I have a graph for that, but I thought it was worth mentioning. The third driver of the U.S.-Venezuela defense relation is, of course, economic bonus. Secu uh, national security is the highest investment of any country. It's the most expensive one. Uh, so how a country is doing economically is going to have an impact on that bilateral relation. Here we see economic growth is chart taken from the International Monetary Fund World Economic Outlook. The blue line is Venezuela. The much lighter line is the United States, which I included only for comparison to highlight. In this graph, I'm interested specifically in showing two things. One is that brief period of bonanza in the early 80s, around 1983 to 1989, just about. And the second is the second uh, bonanza period around 2003 to 2007, roughly. During, and these have, um, have connections to defense relations in the following way. Before I advance to the next slide, it's important to remember that most of this economic growth in the case of Venezuela was driven by changes in the price of oil. Until Venezuelan oil production capacity plummeted recently, which was um, a notable story in the New York Times yesterday about this, until that happened, until the significant decline in oil production, oil accounted for up to 98% of Venezuelan exports and over 80% of GDP. So that these big changes you see are not necessarily Venezuela really being productive and engaging in super productive economic activities or expanding to more trade. It, it's mostly driven by changes in the price of oil. Likewise, when you see a big decline, it's not necessarily that Venezuela did something terrible at the time, but rather changes in the price of oil. The big declines after 2015 do have to do with domestic problems related to production capacity. Okay, so remember this graph, right? Good times in around the early to mid 80s, and then a second period of good times around the early 2000s. So this graph shows US arms exports to Venezuela. It's also taken uh, from their forthcoming book. And here we see to one very, very big spike around the middle of the 80s, which I thought uh, corresponds to a period of economic bonanza. What happened at that time was that the price of oil was high for what it had been. Um, it was $26 a barrel prox for a barrel of West Texas Intermediate, which is the equivalent to what Venezuela, is the reference price for Venezuela and crude. So Venezuela had more oil. It was interested in, in expanding and investing in its armed forces. And it was democratic. It was a rock of stability in the region. So Venezuela was able to convince the United States to sell it 24 F-16s. This was at a time when the sale of uh, military aircraft to Latin America was forbidden by Congress. 
but the president was able to get an exception for Venezuela to purchase this aircraft. It was a very expensive investment and the very, very tall peak you see in the middle of the graph reflects the payment for those 24 aircraft in the middle of the 1980s. This was probably the height of the US-Venezuela defense relation. Venezuela was very democratic at the time. It was doing well. The economic situation was well, was good. Um, Colombia was in chaos next door. Um, and so all the factors aligned to this very, very strong relationship that is demonstrated by the fact that the president sought an exception so that Venezuela could purchase very expensive weapon systems from the United States. You might notice that there was a second, let me see if I can go back one slide. There was a second peak um, around the early 2000s that does not correspond to a similar peak around the early 2000s in this graph. Um, and what happened there has to do with this deterioration of the relationship. I told you that this relationship is in two acts, one before Chavez was elected, one after Chavez was elected. Before Chavez was elected, before authoritarianism, economic bonanza would signal, as we see in the 80s, increased investment in the armed forces, purchases from the United States. After Chavez was elected, a similar period of economic bonanza no longer corresponds to increased arms purchases from the United States. In fact, by this second period um, of economic bonanza, two things had happened. Um, in 2005, Venezuela had decided not to send any more military personnel for training and education to the United States. And in 2006, the United States uh, enacted a ban on arms sales to Venezuela. So that the tiny little Peaks you see there predate this ban, and then after 2006, the line just kind of flatlines. I don't know, I haven't been able to find why there's a tiny spike in 2015, but it's probably payments owed from before. Um, so that's a very important part. Um, while the economy was going well in Venezuela, while there was a period of economic growth, we see that stronger relationship pre-Chavez, post-Chavez, we don't see the same effect again. During Chavismo, so from the election of President Luis Chavez until today, even though the current president is Nicolás Maduro, we still think of this whole regime as Chavismo. We see that rather than being two democracies talking to each other, it's now a situation where the United States is a democracy and Venezuela is an autocracy. Here we come again to the point that I was making when I was speaking about the period prior to 1989, which is, can we really say that this is an autocracy? So it's, I have not been able to find the first US official to openly call, the first instance of a US official publicly calling Venezuela an autocracy. Instead, we see the deterioration of the relationship in this kind of shift in recognition of the US on the US part about what was happening in Venezuela through these um, two vignettes. The first is Secretary of State John Kerry's response to the elections in Venezuelan elections in 2013. Venezuelan elections on 2013 were for somebody to finish the presidential term that Hugo Chavez had just been elected to the previous year. So if you recall, Hugo Chavez was elected to his third, fourth, depending on how you count, consecutive term in 2012. He died shortly thereafter. At the beginning of 2013, he died in Cuba from his deathbed. He told his supporters that to continue the revolution, it was important that they vote for Nicolás Maduro. This at the time was seen as a kind of surprise announcement because people expected Diosdado Cabello, who had served in the military with Chavez, to possibly be named the successor not Nicolás Maduro, who had a background um, as a union leader in a truck driver. So in 2013, Nicolás Maduro announces that he won the election. It was a margin of less than 1%, fewer than 1%. It was a very contested election. People reported irregularities. And the response from the United States was this. If there are huge irregularities, we're going to have serious questions about the viability of that government. Not outright contaminating the results of the election, 
not calling Venezuela an autocracy, just kind of hinting that maybe we weren't going to be super happy with it. Um, the tone changed in the time since. And by 2018, new Secretary of State Mike Pompeo issued this new statement. The United States condemns the fraudulent election that took place in Venezuela. This so-called election is an attack on constitutional order and an affront to Venezuela's tradition of democracy. Until the Maduro regime restores the democratic path in Venezuela, the government faces isolation from the international community. And that ended up being true. So what happened was that the United States was able to work together with other Western nations to not recognize the results of, to condemn the election that took place in 2018 and say they would only recognize Nicolás Maduro until the term he was serving at the time ended at the start of 2019. 2019, Nicolás Maduro would have started the term that he supposedly won in 2018. However, after the U.S. failed to recognize the results of that election, it meant that he wouldn't be the president in January 2019. Instead, um, the majority leader for the legislature, who was opposition figure Juan Guaido, would assume the duties of the executive, which ended up being translated as there's two presidents in Venezuela. That's it's not the case. Uh, it's as I'm explaining it now. Um, and then that gave the US kind of a lead to start working with Guaido. What's important here is that even though I'm talking about a moment prior to Chavez and a moment after Chavez being a breaking point in the relationship, there isn't a specific time in which um, the US very clearly calls Chavez uh, or Maluda for that matter an autocrat. There is a time on the flip side of their relationship on the Venezuelan side when Venezuela moves away from a close partnership in defense, specifically with the United States. And that time came in December 1999 when shortly after being elected president of Venezuela, very strong rains happen in the northernmost part of Venezuela, just north of Caracas and left many people homeless. Um, Venezuela is not really susceptible to hurricanes or tropical storms. This is probably the highest level of natural disaster the country had seen since an earthquake in the 1950s. Um, for that, the U.S. offered assistance, military assistance, humanitarian assistance for Venezuela to recover, and Chavez refused to accept the assistance. That moment from the Venezuelan perspective marked this breaking point. Um, in the before and after, but we don't have a similar thing in just thinking about regime type. So that's the first part. Like I said, there's three drivers. There's regime type, there's Colombia, and there's the economy. So we discuss regime type after Chavez. Regarding Colombia after Chavez, we saw a big shift in the situation in Colombia. I'm sure that you guys being at start probably have heard about this. Uh, from Dr. Coven plenty. If not, please talk to him about it. Um, and here again, I have a quote to kind of highlight from the U.S. point of view how Colombia is perceived. And this is from, um, again, Secretary of State Mike, sorry. This one is from Secretary of Defense James Mann, so previous Secretary of Defense. And here he says, Today, Colombia is one of America's most capable and certainly most reliable partners in both Latin America and even in the world in many ways. As I told you before, the U.S. can't really, has not so far been able to simultaneously be good partners with Colombia and Venezuela. And here, Matt is saying, we're working closely with Colombia, which means not working closely with Venezuela, which makes sense in light of what we've learned about um, regime type in the region. It's important here to highlight too that during the whole time that Chavez was coming up as a military officer and including during his period as president and even to the present day, Venezuelan armed forces, not to the present day, but to the extent that Venezuelan armed forces were a professional military institution up to at least the mid 2000s, their working theory of conflict was to prepare for conflict with Colombia, conflict on the border either as a result of instability in the border areas right about by guerrillas or as a result of problems with territorial claims. A lot of the borders in Latin America were porous or not well-defined. 
in the conflicts, the few interstate conflicts that there have been happening about this. Um, so that's, even though Venezuelans and Colombians talk about each other as being um, brother or sister, patria's fatherland, in reality, um, definitely from a defense and military point of view, there's always been this suspicion um, of each other. So that in recognizing the value of the partnership of Colombia, the U.S. is not saying, but it's evidencing, putting in clear up, yeah, making it very clear that the partnership is no longer with Venezuela. Lastly, on the third axis, we saw that decline, um, economic decline in Venezuela after the mid-2000s, where that showed peak around 2007. Um, and what I want to highlight here is that that um, fragile economic situation presented, in addition to this kind of removal from the United States because of the difference in regime type, presented an opportunity for extra hemispheric players to try to gain ground in Venezuela. Extra hemispheric players, if you guys haven't heard this term yet, is just a term that the US government uses to refer to state actors that are outside North, Central, South America and the Caribbean. We can't really use extra regional because from a Latin American point of view, Latin America and the US are different regions. So extra hemispheric captures that, not the US, but somebody else. Um, so this period of economic decline and this disengagement from the US created an opening for extra hemispheric players to come into Venezuela. And this was highlighted in remarks by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo last year. China's bankrolling of the Maduro regime helped precipitate and prolong the crisis in that country. Chavez invested over 60 billion, 60 billion with no strings attached. Well, it's no surprise Maduro used the money for tasks like paying off cronies, pushing pro democracy, crushing pro democracy activists and funding ineffective social programs. Um, and that's just creating that. There was a gap. There was money needed from the regime. Venezuelan regime needed money. Maduro's regime needed money. The economic growth was not there. The prices of oil were not there. Oil production was not there. Venezuela sought and received this money from China. Um, and then this has been an important backstop for in maintaining the regime afloat. So whereas before we saw that economic bonanza signaled closer relationships to the United States, now we see after Chavez a period of economic decline signals closer relationships with other players outside of the United States and outside of this hemisphere. What comes next? So again, we broke the U.S.-Venezuela defense relation into two. Before Chavez, after Chavez, we looked at the three drivers of that relationship. Similar regime type before Chavez, stuff is going to go great. Different regime types presents challenges, beginning of deterioration of relationship. Second driver, relationship with Colombia. When Colombia is not doing well, the U.S. has to partner with Venezuela to address the situation there. Relationship goes well. When Colombia is able to get its house in order, um, the U.S. is able to directly partner with the Colombians, leaves Venezuela out. Third driver, economic situation. When the economy is doing well, Venezuela is able to invest in the armed forces, uh, seek support from the United States, strong relationship there. After Chavez, when the economy is not doing well, leaves a gap, uh, and that creates an opportunity for extra hemispheric players to come in and fill that gap. So when we think about what might be coming next, from a defense relationship point of view, there's a whole bunch of things that are gonna be coming next when we think about the structure of the military in itself and still military relations, but we can talk about that in the question part if you want. Um, so when we think about this macro level um, and about what comes next, the first thing to remember is that what comes next, the first question is next after what? A transition away from Chavismo, so Maduro stepping down from power. Um, let should really say a transition from Maduro. So the fact that Maduro leaves power doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a transition to democracy. There could be a transfer of power from Maduro to a similar figure, from Maduro to a pseudo-democratic, but still um, pseudo-democratic leader, from Maduro to a democratic leader that closely um, 
follows Chavismo's ideology or to the opposition. We don't, we don't know what could happen. So that's the first thing to look for is what are the contours of the regime that takes place after Maduro, if there is to be such a thing. Um, the second one is instability on in the border areas on both sides. As Venezuela has deteriorated um, and come very close to being a failed state, non-state armed groups in Colombia have um, made an incursion into Venezuelan territory. And that's gonna have important consequences, be an important challenge for whoever comes next after Maduro, as well as present challenges for the US-Colombia, US-Venezuela relations. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, and the third one is interest and extra hemispheric acting. From the perspective of whoever comes next, and this is, um, when we talk about extra hemispheric actors in Venezuela, there's two especially that, that are most important. Iran certainly has a presence in Venezuela and an interest in maintaining the Maduro relationship, the Maduro regime afloat. But the two extra hemispheric actors that in my opinion matter most for this are China, which holds debt from Venezuela. And there's the question about whether somebody that's not Maduro would be obligated to repay that debt and under what terms. And then Russia, which has more of an ideologic, strategic interest in maintaining a presence in the country. We don't yet know how they would react to a change in regime. We did get hints from China last year when um, the US refused to recognize Maduro's second term and instead worked with the international community to recognize Guaido as a temporary head of the executive. At that time, so in January of last year, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs did come out with a statement to the effect that they have a policy of not interfering with domestic politics in other countries and that they would be happy with whoever was in power so long as that person paid the debt. But that's, that was a year ago, it was a statement. We don't, we don't really know even what the extent of the Venezuelan debt to China is because of the lack of transparency in that bilateral relation. So what should we be looking out for? Well, the first thing is that Maduro wants to hold elections at the end of this year. He seems to think that holding these elections and really winning these elections somehow um, can get him back in good standing with the international community, maybe with his own people. There's a lot of very healthy doubt and skepticism over the quality of these elections uh, and the possibility that, and whether they would present the opportunity for a transition. The US has not been supportive of the elections. The EU instead recently sent a representative to try to work with Venezuela to ensure minimal de democratic conditions are met. That's from the international point of view. From the national domestic Venezuelan point of view, the opposition had initially refused to submit a candidate for the election, believing that failure to nominate somebody was a very clear way to tell the international community that these were sham elections. That had been the agreement up to recently. Then about a couple of weeks ago, a strong opposition figure, Capriles, who had run as president twice before, announced that he would be running as the opposition candidate. And that had the effect of splitting the opposition between people that believe he would be a great candidate and would like to vote for him in December and people that believe that the best course of, course of action continues to be to boycott the election to signal uh, their discontent with this electoral process. Second thing to look out for is, I mentioned in passing a couple of times that there's a significant decline in Venezuelan production capacity for oil that has affected the country domestically as it has resulted in very sharp um, cuts in availability of gasoline and very uh, pronounced shortages of gasoline. So far, Venezuela has been able to get around some of this by accepting shipments from Iran. But increasingly, the US has tried to stop these and to cut off gasoline from getting to Venezuela. We should look at that because that can, no more gasoline can be the thing that creates enough discontent in Venezuela to produce a change from within the country. No, we don't know, and I'm happy to talk about that 
uh, more in the questions. And then the last thing is changes in the situation in China and Russia. Uh, any changes to their domestic situation, their perceived international situation, their economic situation could have repercussions for their relationship with Venezuela and by extent uh, Venezuela's relationship with the United States. You'll notice that I didn't add um, in the what to watch for list something about US elections and a change from this point of view because I think, and it's my understanding based on what we've heard from both candidates so far, that both are interested in a transition to democracy in Venezuela and in continuing the maximum pressure campaign to make sure that Maduro leaves office and democracy is restored. With that, I got to the end of what I have planned to talk about and I'm excited to hear your questions and comments. Fabiana, thank you so much. Um, and your speed was perfect. It was absolutely, that was excellent. Um, so one of our first uh, questions was uh, regarding kind of the relationships between the countries and um, how those relationships improve and kind of deteriorate over time. Can you kind of go into detail about what the causes of um, a poor relationship versus a better relationship are, um, I realize you can't cover all of them, but maybe give us kind of an, a broad overview of the things that might affect a country's relationship with each other. So there's all kinds of things. Um, in the context of most Latin American countries, one thing um, that the U.S. is going for it is a history of having close relationships with that country and cultural affinity. Even though most countries in Latin America don't speak English, many citizens within those countries do or have experience of having traveled to the U.S. or been educated in the U.S., especially at the elite and political levels. There's also the experience of just kind of growing up seeing the U.S. as something to aspire to. This is an advantage that's distinct to the United States. No matter how hard um, Russia and China try to press soft power in the region, People in Latin America don't grow up aspiring to be a big movie actress in Shanghai. That's just, that's something that the U.S. has for this history of having been the first country to recognize the independence of many of these Latin American countries that um, Russia and China can't immediately buy. So that's one thing that determines the relationship. The second one, um, or the second point that I would highlight has to do with how important does the weaker partner in the relationship perceive they are to the stronger partner? So a, a lack of attention, like no presidential visits for 23 years, might start to erode the relationship and say, okay, I'm gonna look elsewhere. I understand you're important and you're busy in other wars, but I'm important too. And I'm gonna go get somebody that, that treats me that way. So that, um, the U.S. has, from our perspective, so I said plus one for the U.S. for the cultural ties, negative one for the U.S. for um, kind of the slow erosion of the diplomatic relations. And in the past, let's say five to ten years, there's been any number of vacancies for ambassadorships in Latin America overall, including ambassador to Venezuela, which has been vacant for years. Um, and that creates an opportunity for incursion by other powers. One last thing in the defense relations specifically is that these are very path dependent. So once the US bought the F-16s from the United States, it has to buy parts in training from the United States. So for the life of that asset, that relationship can't completely fall apart because that's we are the only ones that make that. They would have to work with us. Conversely, as Venezuela and other countries look for alternative suppliers, then that creates path dependence and a stronger relationship with a different partner. And that's going to be hard to break because you can't just change your whole military hardware, just because, especially if you're in an economic crisis of the kind that Venezuela is now and is expected to be in for an unspecified but large number of years. Sure. Um, so our next question is, how do you see the ongoing dynamics in terms of the pandemic? And um, I know you mentioned the forthcoming U.S. presidential election is kind of not necessarily on the radar, but um, if that will that have an effect uh, on the relationship between the United States and post-Chavismo Venezuela? Yeah. Um, 
So the pandemic has been great for Maduro. Um, if you're a dictator or something that tell, and you're in a country where there's no gasoline, something where you can tell people to stay home, it's great. That's fantastic. That's a godsend. Um, and Chavez, and Chavez, Maduro has definitely taken advantage of this. Um, he has implemented a stay-at-home order that literally fluctuates from week to week between total, complete stay-at-home when there really is no gasoline to a week of flexibilization when people are allowed to go out. And for everything we've learned and unlearn about management of pandemic, alternating between going out and coming home does not seem to be any public health advice. Um, but instead it's based on what's politically, what makes political sense for him. So pandemic um, godsend, there has been the true human cost of the pandemic in Venezuela is masked by the broader humanitarian crisis. It's hard to say how many people are affected by COVID versus affected by any number of other health problems that were already happening in the country before. The most recent official figures suggest that um, released yesterday or today uh, put the number of COVID cases around 600, which for a country of 30 million seems like a complete lie. Now that's all the information we have. Um, and then regarding the presidential election and what changes we can expect here, I think we can definitely expect the uh, Biden administration to have a deeper um, bench of expertise on Latin America. I don't know that they have different policies for or have announced a different approach to working with Maduro other than continuing to mount pressure and hope that it results in a transition. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, so for our next question, um, pivoting slightly away from, well, pivoting def definitively away from the United States, mm -hmm. but what sort of strategic interests does Russia have in Venezuela? So there's a few. One is um, interest in oil and partnering in the oil sector which seems like a risky investment because I don't think you'd want to put all your eggs in the oil basket, but that's something that we have seen. A bigger one, or the one that, there's a few that are mentioned by people who are experts in Russia, I will say that. The one that I subscribe to um, is as a sort of tit for tat for abuse in Venezuela as a place that is close, close to the United States. Um, I don't want to say in retaliation, but in response to the United States um, movements in Ukraine. And that one makes sense, um, which is the main reason to not disregard Latin America, is that it's close to the United States. It creates an opportunity for somebody else to be close to us in our homeland, and that's, you do not want that. That's like leaving the front door open in your house. You don't do that. I mean, maybe in the middle of, you know, Michigan, where I used to live, you do that, but definitely not here. Sure, sure. Um, thank you. Well, we have uh, one question here from Barnett. Um, so you mentioned that uh, Chinese hard cash infusions and various extra hemispheric powers uh, v views on regime change. But as the DOD and START itself shifts emphasis to focusing on great power competition, can you expand on what China, Russia, and Iran have at stake in Venezuela beyond debt obligations that are unlikely to be repaired? And what can the U.S. government do to counter near peer competition? competitors in Venezuela and the region more broadly during a regime transition? It was a lengthy question, so if you need me to ask any of that again, then I'm um, happy to I'll get to the parts that, that I paid attention. Hi, Burnett. I was counting on easy questions from you. Um, so I think the, the um, on the China part, um, some of those loans have been to get infrastructure in Venezuela and elsewhere. And there is a doubt about what would happen in the event that Venezuela is unable to repay those loans, would we have a situation in Venezuela similar to what we had in Sri Lanka with a port, where China now owns a port that's three hours flying distance from Miami. That I think is the main concern and possible strategic advantage for that, um, is gaining ground closer to, for everybody I think, is just that Venezuela is really, really, really close to the United States. Um, it's by plane, it's under three hours from the capital of Venezuela to Miami, which is not a sparsely populated part of the United States. So I think 
the biggest part um, from their perspective is probably this proximity to United States territory. A second part is continuing is that it helped with allies for their anti-American rhetoric, which helps expand an alternative worldview, which is the second view of great power competition. One is that it's going to eventually lead to head-to-head -head combat against um, another power. The second is that we're just competing for different views of the world. And in supporting a non-democratic regime, these countries are expressing support for an alternative view of the world that they hope to persist so that democracy is not as the United States has tried for ages and ages, um, the only game in town. I think I answered <laughs> all of Barnett's characteristically very uncomplicated <laughs> um, question, which I will remember for when he speaks and I'm in the audience. <laughs> good, good. He deserves it. That's a good idea. Um, uh, let's see, our next question. Uh, do you think the influence of external players on Venezuela would result in an impasse in relation to the U.S.-Venezuela relationship? So that's, I hope not, but this is the kind of situation where, for example, with the um, Iranian ships bringing oil to Venezuela could create opportunities for miscalculation on, on either side especially because of there being no high-level uh, diplomatic representation between Venezuela and the U.S. that could clearly communicate what's happening. The highest U.S. government official in charge of Venezuela right now is the charge for the embassy. There's no ambassador, and the charge is in Colombia. So that's not really the kind of close relationship that would lead to, that's not like a red phone where you're going to be able to quickly resolve a misunderstanding. Um, so I hope not, but um, it seems rife for, I think I'm using rife correctly. <laughs> I think so too. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, uh, historically foreign aid has been used as a tool of foreign policy by the US, China, and Russia. With the Venezuela economy um, having deteriorated, do you think the US could outbid the other two major players to lean Venezuela back towards democracy? And do you think the government of Venezuela would be willing to accept the aid as a lifeline for the economy despite the ide ideological differences or it possibly being conditional upon holding legitimate elections? That's a good, so would the U.S., would Venezuela accept, like the Maduro regime accept aid from the U.S. now? No. Hmm. They are going to hard pass on that opportunity. Um, the few attempts that the U.S. has made, which try to circumvent the regime to get aid to the Venezuelans have been rebuffed by the Venezuelan government. They, no matter how desperate they are for money, they cannot, um, this is, has happened more so recently. They cannot be seen as taking money from the U.S. In the past, Maduro did try to talk, um, to talk to the U.S. about um, getting aid, but that was, just unsuccessful given the conditions that the U.S. put. And that goes back to the great power competition, which is if we are in this great power competition and this strategic competition, and it really is about the view of the world and whether liberal democracy is the right way to organize people and societies or if an alternative is okay, then re eliminating the conditions on our aid so we can compete head to head with, with China and Russia and their different views of the world in a way, it makes it so that we're forfeiting, from my perspective, right? If the competition is for democracy versus non-democracy, and you're saying, oh, to win, I have to give aid without conditions, we're giving up a little of what we're supposed to be fighting for. In the future, if there were to be a transition, would that regime accept aid from the United States? Even that's a complicated question, because an alternative to the Maduro regime to be successful is going to have to get Chavistas and former Chavistas to vote for it and to believe in it to move ahead. And you'd have to wonder after 22 years, assuming this ends soon, of anti-US rhetoric, how would a new president 
what would the messaging have to be for a new president to accept aid from the United States? And in what specific sectors would the U.S. be able to help? Remember that a new regime is going to have to repay this money to China so that potentially aid can be seen as plugging up holes left by redirection of money to China. That's a hard sell for American taxpayers too. Like we're going to give $100 to Venezuelans because the $100 they were supposed to use, they gave to China. That's, I don't know that people would necessarily put that together, um, but it gets complicated. Sure, sure. Um, for our next question, uh, USA to Colombia has caused tensions. Um, and has the US had, um, if the US had provided similar support to other Latin American nations, um, has that had any further impact on US Venezuela relationships? That's a really good question. So the aid that has caused the most impact to Venezuela is aid to Colombia because of this history of conflict. It's not even frozen conflict. It's a perceived potential for conflict on the board, which included things like the U.S. Um, granting U.S. base, uh, Colombia granting the U.S. basing access, which Venezuela saw as a threat. Under different conditions, under a condition where the U.S. was also a very strong partner to Venezuela, maybe access to bases in Colombia wouldn't have been seen as threatening to Venezuela. But given the conditions at the time, this access to bases in Colombia was not received well by the Venezuelan presidency at the time, by Hugo Chavez, and creates those problems. Um, the other kind of conflict like that that there's been was um, between the U.S. and Bolivia when Evo Morales in 2000, I want to say 2004, but that's just to say a number, I don't really remember the year, accused the DEA of spying and trying to start a coup against him. So Evo Morales went and expelled the DEA from Bolivia and the ambassador. In response, the U.S. expelled the Bolivian ambassador from the United States. Nobody had called on Chavez. This, you heard the story, it's Bolivia and the US. Chavez raised his hand and said, we expelled the American ambassador from Venezuela. Then the United States had to say, well, we expelled the Venezuelan ambassador um, from Washington. And just like that, in a period of two days, four ambassadors were left up in the air, like the Bolivian and Venezuelan guys to Washington and then the Americans to Bolivia and Venezuela. It took, that happened at the end of Bush's presidency. It took until Obama's presidency for somebody new to be nominated, then that guy, Chavez said he would not accept. So we haven't had an ambassador, a real, real ambassador since that time, which is not necessarily an implication. It's like a roundabout way of saying there have been others, but they're a lot more far-fetched um, than, than the issue with Colombia. Right, right. Um... Uh, our next question is, do you believe the Silver Core coup attempt significantly decreased U.S. soft or hard power in South America? Um, if yes, what do you think is the best way to rebuild it? And do these sorts of shenanigans provide tangible gains for competing powers like China, Russia, or Iran? Wow, another great question. Maybe I'll spend this afternoon with all of you. We've got great attendees. Um, so, I mean, it's amazing. I'm pretty happy. Yeah. Um, so the Silver Core um, coup attempt didn't get a lot it didn't have a strong effect, like a lasting effect on Venezuelan or Latin American politics because Latin American politics really is like that first episode of Narcos. It's magical realism. Crazy stuff happens every day. So from our perspective, this might seem like, oh my God, I can't believe this rogue dude went in Latin America. It's like, that happens all the time. Not that specific thing, but there's all kinds of crazy stuff happening so that Something like this has an impact at the time, but doesn't, this is happening against the background of humanitarian crisis. So Venezuelan people today are just thinking like, I'm hungry and I have no gas in my car and maybe there's COVID. Mm. People are not um, still thinking about that. Other than it does fuel, again, with Latin Americans and their interest in magical realism, it does fuel all kinds of very interesting conspiracy theories. So if you do read Spanish and you Google that, you'll come up with like all kinds, but that's it. Um, 
soft U.S. soft power in the region, as I was saying a little bit ago, I think remains strong. It's been, despite recent disengagement and disinvestment in the region, there's a long history there. There's a strong community of people with Latin American heritage in this country. They've achieved prominence. They, we share in sports. We share in movies. We share it's mostly Christian countries on both sides. Like, and that's hard um, to erode. Well, that at least sounds like a hopeful note. <laughs> I'm an incredible optimist. So even though this is a very, very bleak subject, I try to, on a positive note, I do think there will be a transition to democracy in Venezuela at some point. If you're interested in Venezuela and whether there will be a, tr a transition in the future or in U.S. engagement with Latin America overall, after your time at start, you can come over, hang out with us at the Ferry Center. We have had people who come from START, and though I love all our interns equally, some of my favorite, well, my favorite have come from START. And they're doing amazing things. So our virtual doors are open there for you guys if you're interested. That, that sounds perfect. <laughs> and right back at you. Um, and then also, I think with that uh, glowing recommendation, I think that's a perfect place to end for today. Um, so thank you, Fabiana, so much for being with us today. Thank you. I am trying to write out my email address here so that I can share it. Um, Certainly. Yeah. Um, and for all of our attendees, if you'd like to also reach out to Fabiana, and, but you're not able to grab her email address right now, you are welcome to reach out to us at START and we can get you into contact with her. Um, I did drop a link into the chat. If you like this event, please feel free to sign up for one of our future events. Our next event will be on November 12th when West Point's Combating Terrorism Center Assistant Professor Dr. Amira Jadun will explore understanding the rise and resilience of Islamic State Khorasan in Afghanistan. Otherwise, uh, Fabiana, again, thank you so much for joining us today. And everyone else, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you for the invitation. Have a good day. Bye.